Hi, I'm Paul Morshead. I've been working as an actuary now for over 25 years, where I'm continually analysing data, trying to understand things, how they work, and use that to predict the future. This is a toy called Pop-Up Pirate. I wanted to see if I could use those same mathematical skills to decode how this toy works, understand if it's random, and use that knowledge to try and predict the future. If you haven't seen this toy before, it works by putting swords into the barrel until the pirate pops out. So what I've done is I've run lots of individual tests, playing this toy in controlled manner. And now I think I can conclude that this toy is not random. I think I know how it works without taking it apart. And I also think I can improve your chances of winning or perhaps losing if you want to give your kids a good day. So, how did I use maths to win at Pop Up Pirate? Well, firstly, I gave each hole a number from 1 to 24. Handily, the toy had a label, so I aligned hole 1 to the left hand edge of the label and on the top row. Here's a red sword in hole 1 to illustrate the point. Then hole two is next along clockwise, hole three comes next, and so on until we go all the way around and get to holes 11 and 12 on the top row. Next, we drop down to the bottom row and assign hole number 13. Using our system, hole 14 is next, then hole 15, and again, we go all the way around until we get to holes 23 and 24. Now I turn the hole and the toy into a set of numbers. I can start to carry out my mathematical analysis. I decided to carry out control games, whereby I picked a starting hole, jabbed the sword in, and then moved on to the next hole sequentially. So if I picked hole 22, for example, I would poke holes 22, 23, 24, and then go back up and do holes one, two, three, etc., until the pirate popped out. I then note down the starting hole and the hole which triggered the pirate to pop out, and therefore the player to lose. This is an example of me carrying out one test. So this is how I carry out a test. Firstly, I press down this central button, then I get the pirate, put him in, give him a little spin, and then I start putting in the swords. I'm going to start from hole 12, which is this one here, put it in, wasn't expecting it to pop quite so quickly. Um, assuming that hadn't popped, I would put this in hole 12. Then the next one would be hole 13, which we know is diagonally down and right here. And then 14 and so on. Actually, you're getting data already just looking at it like this. So I can see that these swords are pretty, are pretty weak when they go in the bottom ones. Uh, they tend to be, well, this one isn't particularly, um, they tend to be a bit more solid um, in the top ones. And also, the way we start the mechanism is we push down this central column. And I think that's helped me to understand how this toy is working. So, out of 144 trials, the pirate popped up on a hole in the top row 110 times, with only 34 times the pirate being triggered by a bottom hole. If that were a 50-50 chance of top or bottom, then we're talking a 1 in 19 billion chance of this happening. I'm using the binomial distribution to calculate that. Often statisticians use a 5% confidence interval to disprove their hypothesis, which is actually quite a high bar and can lead to some incorrect things slipping through or vice versa. However, in this case, the math is very much with us. We can conclusively say that the toy is not random. Well, assuming I didn't bias the test deliberately or accidentally. Let me know if you do this and get different results. But I'm going to stop doing tests now. My wife already thinks I'm losing it playing with this toy so much. Now, we could just leave it here and say, just pick down the bottom and you'll win a lot more than you lose. But we've got data here we haven't considered yet. And we haven't figured out how the, to the toy works yet either. So we need to remember to start each test, we take this and we push down 
the central hole. So we know this is the mechanism uh, which is determining the next random hole. So let's do some analysis and see if there's any relationship between consecutive holes which cause the pirate to pop out. This is an extract of the data I've collected. So the first row shows that the pirate popped on hole six, and then the next time it popped on hole one. After hole one, it next popped on hole nine and so on. I've calculated the difference so we can see how many times round it took to get to the new pop. And those numbers in the third column look fairly random and spread to the naked eye. However, let's get all this data and put it on a chart to see if there's anything more conclusive that stands out. Actually, yes, it is very clear that there's something going on here with some numbers being hugely more likely than others to pop the pirate. Using a chi-squared test suggests that this is something like a one in 200 probability of occurring. Again, this strongly fails at 5% confidence interval, so we know we're onto something. Now remember, we have 12 holes on top and 12 on the bottom. So holes 12 apart are actually very close horizontally and just differ by row. So holes 1 and 13 are very close, as are holes 12 and 14, and so on. Let's see if we can make this picture even clearer. This chart just puts together holes 12 apart, and it really makes clear that there's a wave shape coming through. If I did many more tests, this would probably get very smooth. But even as it is, there's no doubt that the whole number is much more likely to move a certain number of turns anti-clockwise than other numbers after each pop. And I think this is the mechanism shining through. We push down the button and it spins a central cylinder anti-clockwise about four or five turns, so on average about 135 degrees. There must be another mechanism which selects the top or bottom row, which I can't figure out from this test, other than to say from our previous analysis that it massively favours the top row. Note that the range of riskiness between individual holes using this data is much larger than just sticking to the bottom row. So our improved strategy is to avoid holes from two to six turns around from the previous pop-up hole and actually go for hole zero to five turns back instead. Given the choice, we should pick the bottom row rather than the top, but the horizontal axis is much more important to us than the vertical. OK, we're almost there on our understanding and on our strategy, but there's one more thing to consider. As we know, we push down this button to start each test and clearly it's a mechanical device and any mechanical device can have issues and this isn't a particularly expensive toy um, and I have noticed quite often um, that the first sword that you put in triggers the pirate to pop out so let's have a look and have a look at some data just to see whether there's any relationship between the order of the sword going in and the likelihood of the pirate popping up This is an extract of the data I've collected. So the first row shows that I started with hole one and then the pirate popped on hole six. And the next time I again started with hole one and the pirate popped on hole one and so on and so on. In the third column, I've calculated whether it was the first, second, up to the 24th hole which caused the pop. Again, those numbers look fairly random and spread to the naked eye, except that we can see there are a lot of firsts coming up on the 15 tests shown. Let's get all this data together and put it on a chart to see if anything more conclusive stands out. So this is an interesting chart. There's clearly some diversity from the mean. This data set just about fails the chi-squared test with a 1 in 67 likelihood. So there's something here, but not as conclusive as the other findings. The biggest deviation from expected is the number of first swords which pop the pirate, with 12 pops compared to slightly less than six expected. In fact, the actual versus expected data for the second through 24 swords passes the chi squared test, and so we cannot say it's not random. I'm probably stretching the maths a little here to draw too heavy a conclusion, as I can't really explain why the four sword apparently never pops the pirate. However, we could add one more guideline to our strategy, and that's to be polite and let our opponent go first so they get the risky first sword. Going back to our understanding of how it works, I think this points to the mechanical nature of the toy. I think what happens is that sometimes the mechanism doesn't quite get into position and so is susceptible to popping on the first sword, regardless of which hole is chosen. 
So, we can say that maths has helped us in three different ways to decode this toy. Firstly, we understand how it works. You push down this button and it turns a mechanical cylinder anti-clockwise to set the next hole which will set off the pirate. We know that the bottom holes are much less likely to set off the pirate. We know that the next time the pirate pops up is likely to be about four or five turns anti-clockwise around the barrel. And we also know that it's not perfect and so by offering politely to let our opponent go first they're more likely to suffer from the first sword triggering the mechanism. So that's how you can win or if you want um, to lose by avoiding or picking the danger holes when you're playing against someone um, you want to beat or perhaps a, a child you want you want to beat to, uh, to let you beat you rather than the other way around. Um, so do you agree? I'd love to hear your views. Um, if you've got this toy and you want to run some tests uh, and send them in to me, I'll update the analysis. Maybe we can get that nice smooth wave shape coming through. Um, if you're the manufacturer, I want to send me one of these, which I can then uh, dissemble and understand exactly whether it works the way um, I think without breaking this toy and upsetting my son, um, then please do. Um, and if you got this far and uh, you've liked this video, please do um, subscribe, please do like it. It helps me to know um, the kind of videos that you enjoy. And if you've got ideas for other things which I can use maths to decode, um, drop them in the comments, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but other than that, thank you for your time, goodbye.